unfortunately had a couple dry runs at this with, with the hurricanes that went through Puerto Rico that affected Florida and South Texas. Uh, we were able to go ahead and, and take lessons learned from, from, from those tragedies and wrap them up into a new strategy um, globally for all our customers. And it had to do with, with you know, with, what Todd had touched on. It had to be to do with empathy. You know, in the collections environment, making every right party contact um, matter is really important. But now it's even more important. It's really getting to know the customer, the consumer, understanding what their ability is, working with them through their, their current financial troubles. You know, obviously, we do we want to get paid? Yes. Do we want to get paid at the cost of losing a, a customer? No, it, it, it's not as important. And I think the industry as a whole has taken a step back and looked at what's my acquisition cost on a customer versus keeping the customer that I have already, that, I'm, that I can build a deeper relationship with, that I can enhance the relationship that we already have and make it something special. So now we have a customer for life versus a customer for six months more, or three months more, or two months more, whatever it may be. And, you know, maybe we are being kinder to each other. Maybe we are being uh, a little bit more uh, thoughtful. I can tell you when I go out and about and do my, my daily errands, I can see people being nicer to each other, almost, you know, bad analogy maybe, but it almost reminds me of what life was like after 9-11, how everybody seemed to rally around each other and, and be nice. Yes, we have other civil unrest going right now, but I'm thinking generally from a, a, a business standpoint, we've learned to be more patient and uh, develop a better relationship and a better understanding for each one of our customers and understanding what their individual um, plight might be. And when did you start that? You did that, I think you did it early on. You did an email outreach yeah. right in the beginning, right? Yeah. Tell me a little bit yeah, about I touch, that. I touch, I touch base on that earlier, but we you know, set up a series of, uh, of emails. It was really, a, hey, we're here to help you. And it was really a targeted um, email, like I said, for, for first time delinquent customers. If they had never been delinquent, duh, sorry about that, delinquent with us before, and now all of a sudden that's popping up. So we really wanted to reach out to these individuals and let them know we're here for you. You have options, you know, we, we can work with you through this. And as a result, um, we did see some of our, our best collection months uh, in April. Yeah, and, I, and, I know that, I, I, I know we did that by phone, but I remember you augmented with email, which is very cool. So let's talk about some aha moments because I think some of us, as I talked to clients, were kind of stunned. Everybody, like when you, when we saw the dip in March, and it's across industry, as I'm talking to more and more folks, there are some aha moments. And I guess, Todd, we'll throw this off to you. What were your greatest aha moments of the last couple of months? Well, I, I think the fact that people's ability to pay actually increased a little bit, right? Uh, that was a huge aha moment for us. You know, we were anticipating, you know, just on the acquisition side, right? We were anticipating potentially like, you know, 80% reduction in originations. Um, we did not see that, right? And we uh, did also, probably the biggest aha moment for me is we did not see an increase in our delinquency rate. In fact, uh, it remained flat, which was very surprising because we were, you know, planning to, figure out, okay, how are we going to handle all these customers that are now delinquent? You know, Chaucer's point about folks that are maybe delinquent for the very first time, you know, we had a lot of conversations around, okay, what, you know, we're going to see more first pay defaults, right? We're going to see more, you know, first time in collections types of situations. And it's just weird that we did it. And it ties back into, you know, the, the, the stimulus payments. It was almost like a second tax season, right? at the end of the day. Right. So, you know, I, I think that's a situation where, you know, we were preparing for the worst case scenario. Uh, it did not materialize initially here. 
Um, and so the ah moment was, well, okay, that's a good thing better than a, than a bad thing. Um, however, I do believe that as we get, you know, as the unemployment benefit runs out, and if we don't see an additional stimulus check to our customers, you know, those those uh, preparations for the worst probably will come closer to fruition as we get into July, August, and into the fall. Very cool. Um, yeah, I would agree. I would back. agree with that. Yeah, I would what agree with, the, with everything Todd said. What about the fact ahead, that we're all we're all old school collection people? I mean, we, we might have a hundred years experience between the three of us. So that work at home piece, Josh. I mean, wasn't that a huge? Uh, I mean, you wouldn't have let ever let anybody do that, right? Talk to us about that. No. Yeah, I am extremely old school. I remember making my first collection call on a rotary phone, a rotary dial phone that tells you how long I've been in the, the, the industry doing it, doing things. So from from my aspect, I've always believed that a collector had to have, or, or anybody in any environment, any call center environment, needed to have direct supervision. Um, we had the ability to protect our contacts with our customer, um, with our customers, with with teleperformance, taking the lead. And we started off with a actually a work from hotel program. We put 20 experienced reps, two to a room, uh, with a supervisor in there to help them out through things. And that seemed to go pretty good. And through my open dialogue and our open communication between you know my, my partner teleperformance in, in Jamaica, um, we had a pretty good idea that there was going to be a shutdown that that they were going to really put some limitations on there and we had a quick business decision to make was it more important to stick to the old ways of doing things or was it more important to make sure we were there for our customers and as soon as we had that aha moment if we're not talking to our customers somebody else is going to the decision to, to allow work from home became a no-brainer for us and it's been very successful uh, one of the biggest challenges you have in any call center environment, whether it's, it, it, it's customer care or, or sales or, or collections, is attendance and um, and attrition. You know, losing employees to you know new jobs or whatever. Our attendance that we've seen both internally and externally has never been better. People aren't calling out sick, or people aren't calling out because they didn't want to make the hour commute into the office. Um, you know, they're not calling out sick because their child has a little bit of a cold and they want to stay home and take care of them. They can still do their job and take care of, take care of their child. So it's allowed for a better work-life balance. Uh, the employees are happier. Um, in fact, we had zero uh, employee turnover, both uh, internally and externally with teleperformance last month, and that's unheard of in the call center environment. So I think people have yeah, realized think- that it's a, a, it's a better work-life balance for them and they're putting out the effort and they're doing the jobs dealing with the, the front, you know, the frontline employees are dealing with the customers and, and being successful with it. Yeah. And I know that a lot of our clients and, and many of my peers in the industry organization, we rushed, we rushed to that exercise to stay open as, you know, nobody planned for a pandemic, right? Right.